Hey everyone, Brandon Lee from Virtualization How To. And let's be honest, documentation is one of those things that most of us hate doing. But if you're running a home lab, whether it's one mini PC or a full blown rack of gear, documenting everything the right way is a total game changer. And I'm going to show you just how to do it and what tools that can make your life easier. So let's jump right in. Let's start with why documenting your home lab matters. Isn't it just a lab environment? If your lab is constantly changing, and let's face it, they are. If yours is like mine, it's in constant state of flux. Documentation is more important because of that fact. Now, here's what solid documentation, though, gives you. First, it helps you with troubleshooting. You can retrace your steps when something breaks. Second, it makes it much easier to reproduce those setups. It also reinforces your learning. Writing things down just makes it stick. Fourth, it surfaces patterns that you can then use to effectively create automation. And lastly, it gives you practice with compliance style habits that you're going to need in today's production environments. Now, where do you even start? Well, the answer is simple. Start with an inventory. List all of your components, both hardware and software. Now, what are some things that make sense to track? Well, track things like host names, IP addresses, MAC addresses, make, model, serial numbers, firmware, BIOS, drivers, OS versions, and services that you have running, and even physical location. If you've got multiple rooms or racks, simple tools like Google Sheets or Excel work. But if you want to level up, tools like PHP IPAM and Netbox make this much, much easier. I personally use PHP IPAM to track things like IP addresses, VLANs, MAC addresses, and all of those really detailed things that we like to have when we need to remember something about our network configuration. Now also, if you're a visual thinker like me and visual learner, diagrams are gold. As your environment evolves, a good diagram helps you to recall how and why everything is wired up the way that it is. Now, here's some great free tools to note. There are tools like draw.io, or aka diagrams.net, Excaladraw, which you can even self-host, Lucidchart, which even though it's an enterprise tool, has a polished free tier. Then there's tools like Obsidian Canvas, if you're already an Obsidian user. And of course, there's the old school Microsoft Visio. Use diagrams to document network topologies, things like LAN WAN and your VLANs, VM to host mappings, app dependencies, NAS storage, and your file share layouts. Configuration files are the heart of really all of your lab environments and how they work correctly, especially if you've gotten into things like Docker containers. Don't lose track of your configs. Use something like Git and private repos on GitHub, GitLab, or even Git-T if you're into self-hosting those solutions. I store things like PFSense and OpenSense firewall rules, Docker Compose files, Kubernetes manifests, Ansible playbooks, Proxmox VM configs, and a tool like VS Code is a great front-end editor for all of this with built-in Git support. Now also a home lab wiki becomes your second brain. All of those one-off fixes and unique setups, you need a way to have those written down and to potentially be able to surface those wherever you are. Now, here are great tools to use for something like that. There are tools like wiki.js, which is a modern markdown-based wiki tool. There's Bookstack, which is a clean UI and easy to use, DocuWiki, Obsidian, Hedgedoc, Gitbook, and something like Gitbook is a commercial tool, but again, it has a free tier for a single user. Now, what should go into this documentation? Well, certainly you can write things like how-to guides, troubleshooting steps, OS install notes, container configs, upgrade logs, and really anything else that burned an hour of your time trying to figure out. Don't burn that hour six months down the road, again, pull out your documentation and save yourself all of that time wasted reinventing the wheel. Now your network will get messy fast, trust me. Documenting your network early is the key to having successful documentation. And key details that I like to include are things like VLAN IDs, what they're used for, subnets, reserved ranges, DHCP scope, static IPs, firewall and NAT rules, Wi-Fi, SSIDs and passwords, all of those things you think you 
didn't know it at the moment, but again, six months later. Also helpful tools include things like the Unify controller. It comes with a built-in topology mapper. Uh, also tools like Netbox, again, super helpful for network mapping and documentation. And also open source security tools like Nmap allow you to run regular scans to detect devices or rogue machines. I also use ARPWatch and definitely look at some of my material on spinning up your own ARPWatch container. I think that is a fantastic tool to run not only in a home lab, but in a production environment for security purposes and documentation. Also, automation creates its own documentation. So especially if you're using infrastructure as code tools, like the well-known tools that we're all used to and familiar with and have grown to love, such as Terraform for our declarative infrastructure, creation of that infrastructure, Ansible for config management, tools like Packer that allow you to build out your VM images. So when you write your code and learn to store that code in a Git repository and add a readme file, it's like writing documentation that basically runs itself. You've got everything documented and you know what everything does and it's very transparent. But what if your lab goes down? Backups do matter. Keep secondary copies of all of your documentation and things like cloud storage, a cloud drive, Dropbox, S3 storage, any of that type of storage in the cloud. Also, external drives may be a good solution if you want something cheap and you've already got the external storage. You can use external drives with Restic or Borg. You can also use your NAS with snapshots, think Synology or TrueNAS. Also run backup jobs that grab your documentation folders regularly. Now, there's also the good old-fashioned print out a physical copy. And I do this. I actually like to have a picture from the Unify controller of all of my ports on my Unify network switch, what is uplinked to those ports, the VLANs that are associated, and I can't tell you how many times that has saved lots of banging the head against the wall in a break glass moment when you have something in the network go down, you're having to unplug things, and you're trying to remember exactly how everything is cabled up. Now also, I'll admit, I'm not the best at this, but labeling your gear saves you later. Now, what are some things that you probably want to think about labeling? Things like ethernet cables, power cords, server names, VLAN tags, storage base. I can't tell you how many times, and you probably can relate to this, when you've got a spaghetti ball of cables in your network rack or your server rack, and you think a cable goes to a specific server or a specific specific uplink and you pull that uplink and you're wrong. It doesn't go to that server or that uplink and you take your entire network down. So having those labels on physical cabling so you can reference that and having the labels on both ends just so you know that this cable is indeed the cable that I think I have when I'm trying to unplug a specific server. Now, I also use the Dymo Letra Tag label printer, and I've got a link to that specific label maker in the description for this video. This label maker, it's simple, it's cheap. There are many others out there that are great, more fancy, that do more things. But at the end of the day, all these label makers do the same thing. They help you not to guess which switch port connects with which device six months later if you have those properly labeled. Also, a very important thing that I feel like most need to do, and myself included, much better in their home labs, is to track changes over time in a simple changelog. A simple changelog.md file works great. Now, what is included in this changelog file? Well, you want to log things like the date. What changed? What change did you make, no matter how small or how large? Why it changed? What was the purpose of that change? Making that note will help you to remember what you were thinking six months ago. Now, also, who changed it? If you have more than one in a lab environment, but especially for production environments, that is a tremendously valuable thing to have. And then also document any problems that have occurred due to this change. And you'll be amazed at how often this type of detailed documentation saves you. And if you do it on the front end, and this is always what I run into uh, that bites me in the long run, is the fact that I think I don't have time to do that. 
I'll, or I will remember to do that much later and it never happens. Do the documentation on the front end. Keep that change log among all the other documentation so far that we've talked about. Also, self-hosting is awesome. But what if your network goes down? Now, this is something that you really need to think about. Make sure that you can access your docs even if the lab is offline because the catch-22 that we get into with our self-hosting habits is that, yeah, we've got great documentation, but it's all stored in a Docker container or a VM that is currently down. So how do you get to that documentation? Again, I love having the basics in a physical document inside of my server rack, such as VLANs, uplinks, those types of things, the physical aspects of your lab are really great to have. Then also there are many other options that can be included that can help you with this. You can self-host your wiki, but sync your markdown with sync thing to another location. Use something like MK Docs and Nginx for a static site, keep a backup in the cloud, or again, as we've mentioned earlier, an external drive, and then also maybe having one, two, or maybe even three hard copies of your documentation stored in different locations. All right, that's a full tour of how to document your home lab the right way. It takes effort, but it pays off huge dividends when you're troubleshooting or you're replicating your setups. Now, what tools are you using for your own home lab documentation? I love to learn from you guys, and often the comments that you make on the videos, you often mention containerized solutions or other solutions that are open source that I've never heard of before. And when I get my hands on them, they are just fantastic. So please do let me know what you guys are using and hopefully some of the solutions that I have mentioned so far with some of these pieces and parts of documentation that are extremely helpful in the home lab will be maybe new solutions that you've not heard of as well. Well, I'm Brandon Lee. Please do like, subscribe, and let me know also in the comments what you're using once again. Well, please do stay safe out there, keep on home labbing, and I will see you in the next video.